Nice to meet you. Uh, it's great to have you, and thanks for uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, a kind of a, a, on a was relatively new thing for me too. So this is going to be a, going to be interesting and fun. Where are you right now? What part of in the Toronto. world? In Toronto. In Toronto. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so I am really, really intrigued uh, to learn a bit more about your business. I think it sounds, at least on the uh, from the outside, really, really interesting. Which is why I'm so glad that we're getting a chance to chat about this. So just to start us off, why don't you just quickly give me the high level about what it is that your company does. Sure. Okay. So Art Provocateur is the premier destination for blockchain registered collectors, fine art, and photography in the nude, provocative, and erotic genres. Uh, we, it's, a digital, it's a new digital platform and marketplace offering upscale products, fine art printing, and an exquisitely collect, uh, curated collection of some of the best artists in artworks in the world. And um, we focus all our work on in e-commerce and we do some small events at this, at this point, being a startup, we're doing a lot of a small, well, we were before the COVID uh, came along. We're doing a small uh, events and pop-up gallery style uh, showings. And, but mostly we're an online marketplace and <clears throat> we do all, all our marketing and all our sales online. And it's very challenging because of the um, stigma around nude art and erotic art in general, um, but also because marketing is very difficult due to the nude content. So we face a, a lot of red, red tape and um, things we have to work around because of our content. And it's, it's a very challenging marketplace to be in. So tell me a bit, how did you get into this space? Uh, well, it honestly, it started off as a passion project, and I um, I love uh, photography. So I used to work with a photographer, and um, I just I have this thing for like beautiful um, body shots and and nude nude art, but very very tasteful work. So I, I've developed an eye for it, and I realized when I first started this, I was like, you know, I started dabbling in the space. Um, I noticed that nobody was really focusing on it, and I had reached out to a few photographers who uh, agreed to work with me. So based on their agreement to work with me, I started building a platform for it. And how long ago was this? This was in 2014, where I started really, <clears throat> you know, doing some of the work, and then I incorporated in 2015 and started working with developers and designers and started investing serious amounts of time into it at that point. Uh, well, I got a bunch of questions. So give me a sense of order of magnitude, and I'm not sure the best way to measure that. Is it n number of pieces of art sold, or do you think about it in terms of gross sales or in terms of net revenue, or how are you, how are you doing? What, what scale is this business so far? It, it, well, we're, it's slow right now, especially <laughs> because of COVID. It's really hard. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, we did really well when we were able to actually show the art in, in life because we, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to sell art online and just in general, but there's so much more to it when you can see the beauty of it up close, up front, you see the quality of the work, you see the framing of the work. Um, and that's really sometimes, a lot of times that's what will sell it. Um, so we did very well there, but then since we were, we had to stop the, the physical events then, um, and just focus on online, it, it really did slow down and we've had to downsize, seriously downsize. So I can't really answer that. That's okay. So is the online business a temporary necessity or is that part of the long-term vision for the company? That's definitely the long-term vision. So um, selling art online and, and there's now, I mean, when I started out, there was a handful of companies doing it. And now there's well over 350 companies selling art around the world online. This is online. Uh, so this is definitely the way of the future. Uh, now the blockchain is being used for provenance tracking. So that's the new technology that's getting into the art space or, or the, rather art getting into that technology. And we're working with the blockchain as well. So we're, we're registering art th that way to do pro manage provenance tracking, but also adding credibility to the work and to the artist. Um, and so the, the way of the future is definitely online, but I think it needs to go hand in hand with, with physical events and you know being able to bring people through it in a gallery or doing pop-ups and driving um, attention that way. 
Uh, and so tell me a little bit about the complexity that uh, dealing in erotic art uh, brings to it. So there's a, there's a stigma around erotic art. Unfortunately, you know, if somebody hears the word erotic and they think pornography and they get really afraid and scared of it, but you know, um, erotic art, right? To like the history and the beginning of art, with, you know, thousands of years of paintings, even like back to like, you know, Egyptian times, their nude art was always around. And it, it's called erotic because there's nudity or there's something provocative about it. But it does not mean that it is sexual. It doesn't mean that it is, you know, uh, offensive in any way. So, so it, it's, we're trying to change that. Uh, Narrative. Did I use the right word? Should should is erotic the word you use to describe the the g overall genre? Well, we we call it provocative <laughs> so that we don't scare people away with the word erotic. I try to uh, use that more than erotic, but in the end, I I'm also trying to change the way people look at this style of work and show that hey, this is a beautiful piece of art and it's. You know, I have everything that I've curated to the site. People have said to me, wow, this is really well put together and the work is so tasteful because I am selecting pieces that are really beautifully done. Um, yes, they're nude. Yes, they are provocative. Some of them are really, really erotic, but um, they're all really beautiful and well done. And there are people out there that have these, you know, pleasures and fetishes and who like to look at this kind of type of work. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, the economics of being a, I guess you'd consider yourself a gallery of sorts. I mean, I assume you describe it as a marketplace, which means that you're just really connecting sellers and buyers. You're not taking a position in the art. Is that right? That's right. So we are just a middleman, really. We're, we're acting as the gallery where we are just connecting buyers and artists. What's the, what's the basic, let's say if I was to go into a, a bricks and mortar gallery. What's the basic economic model for that? Is it, do, do, if I paid a thousand dollars for a piece, did they, did the artist get 500? Do they get 850? How does that work? I think it varies by the gallery and the agreement the artist has with the gallery. Um, you know, physical galleries and the, the big galleries, especially the ones in New York and, and all over the world, those guys, I think they charge upwards of about 40 50 percent on a sale i wow i can't i don't know exactly it's not always the same and it also depends on the artist and you know uh, what they can bring their name will bring to the gallery as well and what's your what's your uh, your deal we do uh we charge 30 percent so um and but we also produce the work so we have we have two uh, ways of, of you print you print it in other words for people yeah we we do for so, I mean, it depends. So we are we offer production for digital and photography. We don't offer reproductions of original art. So we won't take a scanned painting and reproduce it and call it a limited edition. If you have a painting, you can sell it on our site at your price and we take a 30% commission on the sale. If we produce it, we have our costs and then you have your commission and we take a 30% of the sale. So it's, it's, there's two ways of doing it. Uh, really interesting. And so, but so basically, I won't go down this hole for too long, but if someone has a physical work of art, canvas, for example, do they ship it from their studio or do you, do you, do you ship it from yours? They ship it directly from their studio to the buyer. Okay. Um, and are there exclusives with the artists or can they make their work available in, on multiple galleries? They can. They, they can work with um, physical galleries. They can work with other online galleries. But we do ask our artists to not sell the same artwork that they're selling through our space with another online gallery because then we're competing in pricing and in our branding. And it, so we do try to keep it unique on our site. At this point, we haven't had, because we're new to erotic genre, the artists that we are working with give us their new erotic genre work and then they'll work with another online gallery for some of the other genres. Really interesting. Okay, I, I've got a whole bunch of directions we can go with this, but what, before I even jump into that, uh, is there anything specific that you, um, you feel you're struggling with that you want to chat about today? So 
So my question was what I've been trying to conquer for a long time here is uh, how can we increase the traffic to our site with the lit limited amount of resources we have today, but also with the limited options we have because of new content or advertising is, you know, there's a lot of red tape. There, we're not able to use social media or Instagram. We can't promote there. So we, we have to be very careful not to get shut down with our Instagram and we really have to be strategic about our marketing. So we are trying different things, but maybe you have some insight as to how we can tackle this uh, because of the, the content that we carry. I do have some opinions. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but I have one more question though. Of the 350 some odd sellers, I think that was the number you used, of um, online photography, online art, was, did I art, miss you? Yeah. Of online it art. It could be for anything, yeah. How many of them specialize in erotic or provocative? Um, you, to be honest, I have yet to find another company that does genre specific nude erotic. I know that they carry nude content. I will in addition to the other genres, so they'll have a, a category for nude photography or erotic art. But uh, I haven't seen a lot of erotic art and I haven't seen yet another site that focuses on this genre. Only. So, um, First of all, I think this is really, uh, really interesting. Um, a really cool idea for a business. Um, and there's cause kind of was th two or three different directions I was going to go in. So I'll just touch on those and then I'll actually, I think I can hit your question right in the head, or at least we can talk in that direction. Um, the first, um, was that you've described it as a marketplace. And whenever I hear those words, my ears perk up because marketplace um, means a very specific thing in the e-commerce world. And uh, it has some really interesting challenges because you are, as you mentioned, you're connecting two different sides of the market. Uh, in your case, the, the people who produce the art and the people who want to buy it. Or as you, you know, as you know, everyone refers to it as the demand side and the supply side. The demand side, of course, in your case, are the people who want to um, buy it. Supply side is the people who want to provide it. And one of the big decisions you have to make as a marketplace is which one of those is the first nut to crack. Because what sinks marketplaces, at least in my opinion, and at least have I studied them, is doing both of them at the same time. Because it's really, really hard to build both of them up at the same time. Of course, you do need both. You can't have an Uber if there's tons of people who want to drive, but no one wants to get rides and vice versa. It doesn't work if you have a lot of people who want rides and no one wants to drive. But the way that marketplaces get traction is usually by picking which one of those is the harder one, uh, the rarer commodity that if I have it, it will attract the other. And I'm not entirely sure in what side of it um, is the more critical one for you, but I suspect that you're correct that if you can build up a big demand side, the supply side will take care of itself. Meaning you're gonna have way more people who want to exhibit art on your platform if you can build a robust um, audience of acquirers of erotic and provocative art. Is that, is that a, a fair assumption? There's no shortage of great photographers if you had a huge audience clamoring for it. Is that right? That's, that's right. So, but then it, I agree with that side of things. It would be great to be able to do that first, but how are you going to build an audience when you don't have the artwork to, to showcase? That's the problem, but you have to, you have to pick, you can't be straddling the two and trying to inch them both up little by little. You really take my word for it, have to nail one and count on the other one showing up. Because mm -hmm. you're correct. I mean, I, I can't name, I'd say Maplethorpe, but he's dead. But, you know, if, if you're going to Maplethorpe, you can't convince him, this, the premier, one of the premier provocative artists, um, to go um, solely with you if he, he looks around and goes, but you have no customers. Whereas um, if you have, if you can go to these artists and go, 
hey, I've got 10,000 people who are clamoring to buy the premier art. That's why you should sell with me rather than sell with this person who has the office in New York City, you know, whatever the case is. But you can also make the argument you should go the other way, that if you can convince someone because of some reason that they should list solely with you, um, and you think that'll build the audience, you do it that way. And the reason this is critical is because you have to then put the conditions in place to make that one side be favored. Now I'm going to say some stuff based on an understanding, which is probably 15 or 20 minutes old. So I will say things with great certainty with the acknowledgement that I don't really fully understand it. But for example, you could perhaps attract someone like a Maplethorpe if he wasn't dead. If you said there's no commission, we're listing for free. Uh, hypothetically, <laughs> I'm not saying you should do that, but that's the type of thinking you would use if you believed that if I build up the supply side, the demand side will be there. You could even do even things more favorable. You say, I'm going to give you a negative 10% commission. I'm willing to, because my I'll pay you more than we capture. I mean, I, I'm making stuff up off the top of my head, but you begin to go to extreme lengths because you believe once I have the gallery of all the best artists, I'll have no acquisition costs because everyone will go, I want that artist, I gotta come here. But you're thinking, and I think you're probably correct, it's the other way around, that if you can build up the audience, you'll have no problem eventually being able to attract artists to demonstrate on you. So we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, with me so far. Uh, my second piece is that um, you started off your quick elevator pitch and there was a bunch of stuff in there. Um, and what jumped out at me was, was blockchain and a marketplace and art and erotic or provocative. I can't remember the term you used back then. And so at that point, the alarm bell that been ringing for me was the focus one. Um, you've, you should, my opinion, you should be very, very careful about staying focused. In other words, if you believed, for example, that, oh, what will differentiate me from the other 350 um, galleries out there, online galleries, um, and the ones that will really help me attract people is blockchain, then you should be all about blockchain if you really believe that that's what customers are clamoring for and that you can be one of the few who offered blockchain certification and tracking and provenance of art, fantastic. My gut is probably that's not the, the, the big bell for people. I, I'm going to yeah. guess it's it, correct. No, I'm not saying you don't offer it. And I'm not saying you don't say it's important to offer it. And that's that you don't say that it's provenance is critical. Perhaps that, that blockchain becomes what is the driver for building up your supply side. But for your demand side, they could give a shit about blockchain. What they care about is I can't get this quality erotic art anyplace else. So I would be picking, being really careful you do these two things, is pick which side of the marketplace is the one that you have to build, and if you build it, they will come. The rest of the business will fall into place. And then you can switch. We'll get to that. Oh, I can talk marketplaces all day long. But, um, and the second thing is to build that, you have to focus very clearly on what, that, what is most important to that singular side of the market, to your demand side. Okay, I'll do the big reveal about how I think you should attract customers. But uh, you, you with me so far in all this stuff? You have questions or comments? Am I am I way off base? No, you're you're right on track, and I agree with I agree with everything you're saying. And you know, I think that it's it's a fine balance of both. Where you we had to start with some artwork. We got the young artists to come on board, and then we started building an audience. But in order to grow in this space, you're right, we do have to focus on building a bigger audience in order to gain and bring on board the bigger artists and the, the bigger names. So it is, it is a fine, you know, like um, a ballet dance, if you will. And that's it's, sort of where we are right now. It's a really, really tough balancing act because in my opinion, you've got to pick one side and dramatically favor that side to make it happen. And then what happens is once that happens, it changes. Once you all of a sudden have this huge, for example, demand side, 
then you can begin changing it and begin reaping the profits from the demand side and build the supply side. But one has to come first because it's so hard to get either of them to work because of the reason you said getting two things in place simultaneously is a bear. Um, so tell me what you're doing with PR. Uh, well, currently we are, we focused on a lot of our, up until this day, a lot of our work has been organic growth. So we haven't done a lot of PR campaigns or invested a lot into PR. And with the limited resources we had, we did, we focused a lot on the physical events and, and uh, organic growth online. So not very much today at this point. The PR, is, I think we wanted to take the PR when we, we were planning to do a New York event, a New York uh, pop-up, but uh, like New York, LA and, and go that route. But um, with COVID, it kind of just sidetracked the entire plan. And uh, this, this pregnant pause is me thinking which I try and do before I open my mouth, not always successfully. Um, so you are in a lucky spot for, I think, a couple of reasons. And the first is that the stigma, the legal complications, the hassles of being in the erotic space um, keep other people away. This, it's not easy. Um, you have to worry about things that someone who is selling uh, cute little drawings of kittens uh, doesn't have to worry about. Right. Um, but at the same time, that's a huge advantage in that um, if you get that right, it will be a big barrier to other people coming after you and allows you to jump in front of people once you begin to put in place all those techniques. The other thing is that sexuality is a trigger uh, and it's the most effective marketing trigger uh, right up there with the word free. <laughs> and um, it would seem that there is a huge opportunity for you to make a lot of noise by talking about something that most people don't want to talk about, but that people do want to hear talked about. And I think your choice of going in the social media direction is fantastic. But, uh, and I think I can't imagine that couldn't be hugely, um, hugely popular especially, and I would imagine that there is artwork which is just to the other side of the line that you also carry? Well, there's, there's really hardcore and there's really, you know. No, I meant the, 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 the safer <laughs> side of the line. In other words, there is, there the is, Instagram yeah, safe is. side of the line. <laughs> There is safe work, uh, absolutely, and uh, you know, fully covered um, models and things like that. But um, the ones that we, the ones that are showing nudity, we have to blur it for uh, Instagram, and we don't even can't even use Facebook. But for Instagram, we we like to showcase artwork on the wall and in rooms, and we will blur the nudity so that we don't get flagged. Yeah. It just seemed that if that's almost, in my opinion, as I imagine, you may, may have spent hundreds and thousands of hours on finding that line. But if you can find that line, I think it's a very powerful thing, including if the artists are comfortable having their work shown on oh, yeah. Instagram. It, but again, it, it's if, if someone is, has 20 pieces with you, that there, I'll say this, would need to be two pieces or three pieces, which can be Instagram friendly. Mm -hmm. but give a very good idea of the quality of the person's work, of the subject matter of the work, but can be shown on Instagram. And then, of course, you do need to uh, be able to link in your bio or link in the comments, um, as I imagine you probably do, to the, uh, to the site to actually be able to see the um, other side of the line um, material. But certainly 
which is how, I mean, it's used for different purposes, but certainly Instagram, um, TikTok a lot, um, other, a lot of the other social media, which are used for people who are trying to um, sell pornography. But they, those exact, in other words, where they, they're showing things which are semi, which are safe for work, so they can be on TikTok and Instagram, et cetera. But then people can go to their my fans or only fans, whatever it's called, I don't know, whatever it's called, the, the, direct people into the places where that the type of work can be shown um, legally and under the right conditions. It would seem to me that's a pretty incredibly good playbook for you to follow if you're not already. And maybe I'm missing something that makes that impossible to do. But the reason I asked about the PR is, in my opinion, PR is the most powerful marketing tool of all, yeah. especially if you have a story. And you absolutely have a story. And I don't think necessarily the story is the art. The story is a little bit the struggle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and I'm surprised that, in other words, you can make the story about yourself and your, your business partner, right? I do, yes. Um, and the, the model, I can't, I'm going I'm to kick myself for not being able to remember the name, but I'm an investor in a company, and I'm not even going to get the category right, but basically it's uh, uh, sexuality products for women. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, it's vibrators, it's gels, it's all those things. Um, and for women, uh, it's all designed for women. It's all marketed to women and their PR angle extremely effectively is the fact that Instagram won't allow them to talk about it, that the New York subway system would not allow them to place advertising there, that they were not allowed to place, um, run television advertising. And so they were able to make their case about this double standard that you could have erectile dysfunction ads in the Super Bowl, but not talk about women's sexuality products in the same um, mediums. But it would seem to me that there's a, an angle right there for you to play to get attention for your business by talking about what it's trying to do, what's trying to make something which is at its heart a healthy thing, which as you pointed out, you know, uh, nudity and erotic art has been with us for uh, centuries. Um, yes, and, yeah, and that definitely. you are just doing what has, what the best artists of their day, that's how they worked. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, I think those two angles, social and public relations, would allow you to get a tremendous bang for very, very little buck. I agree. I, I mean, that's definitely both those sides are something we've been planning and creating strategies and how would we play this and what story are we going to tell. So definitely it's, it's uh, something we've talked about and, and we've been slowly, you know, making our way there with our events and, and, you know, it's just uh, the timing of the situation with COVID and it's, kind of took us back a little bit so definitely it is pr is definitely a place where we want to expand our our um like our story where we want to talk about it yeah you know one of the best things that could happen to you is have someone stop you from advertising someplace allows you to make a story out of it you know well we've already been shut down on instagram once so that's why we are, we're very careful about what we do today is because we've already lost a, a huge following in our first attempt. And uh, so it, it is a fine line and we are trying to figure it out. We're trying to make sure that we don't, uh, you know, cross the line in any way where we were offensive. But, but again, you know, they, it's in their power to say, hey, we're going to shut you down and there's nothing you can do about it. And all that work you've put in is gone. And right. all the followers are gone too. So yeah. it, it is, it's an effort that's continuous and, you know, it's always risky and there's a chance that you may lose it all. Just, you know, one day you wake up and it's gone. <laughs> and they've shut you down. Yeah. 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 That, that's true. And that's something I, uh, even though I'm saying it's a great strategy, it is dangerous because you're right. The, 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 the power they have is so absolute 
and so difficult to argue with because it's faceless. Um, I can see the, the hesitancy there. I guess all, all the more reason to try the PR route, which I'm thinking. So perhaps there's a role to make yourself the, a domain expert in censorship. In other words, that you are a person who writes comments, tweets about that with the, with the goal being that people begin reaching out to you for comment whenever there's any form of a capricious or uh, censorship that you feel is that you're on the right side of. I'm just trying to think of some way to position yourself as a thought leader in a space so that you can begin getting yourself quoted when uh, you know CNBC is running a piece on something that got shut down and they're looking for people actively to interview. And because of the nature of your business is so interesting and different, it would be a perfect place to develop yourself as a resource, as a spokesperson, as someone that magazines, newspapers, websites, television, radio call on to give comment on these things, which allows the name of your business to get out there and generates, a, and which is the most effective way to do the PR. And it's going to be hard to do the PR that says, press release, we now are carrying, you know, John Doe or Jane Smith. Eh, whatever. But if you can find some other way to reach out and get your name out there, that leverages something big happening in the world, that's the most effective way to do it. Agreed. So, so <laughs> Thank you. in a nutshell, um, I uh, it's focus. Focus on what side of the two-sided marketplace you want to be on, which one you need to get right. And if you get it right, the other one will follow. Um, and then focusing your messaging, which is make it really clear what it is you stand for and what differentiates you and not confuse people, um, not embed the message which is designed to appeal to two different sides of the market, but be clear to have your message focused on the side you want. And then I think it really is playing that PR game, which you're already doing, but maybe adding on the role of yourself or your business as the champion, yourself as the pioneer, yourself as the fighter, yourself as a spokesperson. And I'm not sure whether that will come naturally to you or not, but uh, uh, it's a... I'm growing into the role, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's when a, I started this out, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was, I was shy. So like, I, I have definitely had to teach myself how to speak and how to answer. So it's, it's definitely, I'm definitely growing into it. You're doing okay today. Thank you. <laughs> it is the PR thing is, it's like social media and that at first you're going, why does anybody care what I think? But you'll find out the people who do care what you think will find you. And I can assure you, I think the fight that you're fighting and the category you're trying to pioneer and the product you're trying to bring forth to the world is a really good one. Um, and I think people do want to hear that. And I think that you're in the lucky position that it would be wonderful to have a Christian right group in Kansas City fight to shut you down. That would be the best thing that could ever happen to you. Um, Bring it on. <laughs> exactly, once you realize that, <laughs> you'll be all set. Well, okay, well, I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah, so all that, uh, what I do have a big favor to ask is I would love to hear from you in three to six months about how it's coming. I'd For love sure. to hear whether you figured out some way to really make the social media piece work without the fear of it getting shut down, whether you figured out some way to leverage the PR um, and how it's going with uh, opening the floodgates to the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of eager buyers of uh, provocative art. Definitely well, thank you so much.